Hello, Lakeview family. Hope you are all doing well. Uh, it's a, a great week. The temperatures are coming down a little bit. Uh, I was reminded though yesterday, I was hanging out with Mr. John DeBoer. Hello, John. Uh, and he did remind me, part of that can be the days are getting shorter. And I was like, oh, so maybe the heat wave isn't necessarily gone. However, even shorter days mean means a little bit less time to bake in the sun. So it's all good. It's the rosy side of everything. Uh, I'm excited to be back uh, in the pulpit on Sunday. Had an awesome time at Lagoon with our group of, I think, 24 people that went down from Lakeview. It was so fun and exciting. Uh, we had some just great times together, laughed a lot, enjoyed everybody, made it home safely. Um, nobody got overwhelmingly sick on the rides, including myself and uh, Connor and Dorian. Shout out to them. They led the trip and did an awesome job. So we have some great leaders. Uh, kudos to Pastor Jen for preaching on Sunday. Uh, we're blessed with some incredible pastors in our congregation um, and retired pastors and, and elders. We just have a great group of people uh, and leaders a part of this faith family and I'm excited it, it is that is the, the beauty to me of the church uh, that when individuals <clears throat> are gone especially a pastor when they're gone things don't just fall apart and to me that is a sign I hope of good leadership but most importantly it's a sign of incredible people who are just about the business of the kingdom and want to be engaged and pursue the mission and give themselves to that in whatever ways that looks like and so that's exciting to me so sunday um we will officially wrap up our series on keeping up with jesus not the joneses and i decided to end it on uh, this passage of solomon and it's when solomon asks for wisdom um, and we could continue the idea of the of kings obviously continues long after solomon uh, and david i mean at this point we're only officially three kings in uh, to this whole new thing of what kings means for the people of Israel, uh, and which has been kind of right our nexus of comparison. Uh, this huge thing that we've been talking about in the series, Keeping Up With Jesus, Not The Joneses, is this idea of comparison, what that does to us and to our hearts, and ultimately uh, language and, and kind of a theology of sanctification of this idea of surrendered comparison. Uh, and this full surrender of self, including... You know how we compare ourselves to others the way in which the the influence of the world has on us these are all things that we take into account as followers of jesus and it is so poignant in the lives of the people of israel particularly in this season when they are in this kind of wanting to be like everybody else motif and then we find ourselves right with david and then solomon and david as you remember was this was god's response to saul right what he you know, who the people wanted, who the people saw and thought would be great. Uh, but then David says to Samuel, no, you need to anoint uh, David as king because I see his heart. And we've talked a lot and it'll come up again with the story of Solomon. But heart isn't like what we think of in terms of like love or um, kind of this squishy kind of feelings or emotion kind of thing. But really, it is the seatbed of the will and the volition. And so for for what God recognizes and sees in the heart, or as the as the author is saying, and as as we're reading in the text, that the heart is this kind of alignment of David to the will of God and a posture that surrenders to the lordship of God in his life in all things. And that is what God is after, is this radical obedience that is rooted in such deep faith and trust. In God, and so there is no question or doubt, and it boils down as I talk about a lot, right? Choosing God or other than God, and then we see that play out in the life of David, specifically the last couple of weeks, as we've talked about um, his indiscretion with with Bathsheba, its sin. Let's just call it what it is: the rape of the Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah, and the deception that was all of those things. And then we move on to Solomon who is as David's son from Bathsheba, not the first son, not the son from their infidelity, but, but uh, one of her following sons. 
uh, and he is heir to the throne. And so through this line, through this dysfunction, we continue to see the Davidic reign, this line that will lead to the person of Jesus. And up comes Solomon, and the text does not describe or give us specifically how old he is, says that he is, and he references himself as being only a child. Scholars would argue probably late teens, early 20s is, is probably where he would find himself at the beginning of this 40-year reign. And in those moments of ascension to the throne, you see the mimicking of this heart of, of his father David that he saw. And the reality of this kind of relying on God in the midst of, right, right before this, the text talks about how he intermarries, right? He marries the princess of Egypt, which is most likely a very wise, from a worldly standpoint, political alignment with Egypt. But it is totally against uh, kind of the Deuteronomic law, uh, the law of Moses, and in addition to that, so we have him intermarrying the princess of Egypt, but he's also still, it says he followed the heart of his father, David, except he still worshiped at the high places. And this one is interesting because God meets him at this high place. And that's where the dream happens. I mean, he is worshiping God at the high place, but I think it's the reality of the, that he is not worshiping God at the temple, at the Ark of the Covenant, which is kind of the nexus and center of God's presence at that point. Um, and I think just even the worship of God, of Yahweh at a high place, continues to leave that door open for the influence of those around them, which we will see is exactly what happens. So it, it can seem like a legalistic pull. Um, and God still honors, God still speaks, God still blesses, but there is this kind of asterisk, uh, but he still worshiped at the high places and he still intermarried. Um, but then we have... This moment, which is beautiful, where Solomon comes to God, or God comes to Solomon in a dream, and hold on to that. Pastor Dan talked about this idea of pervenience that God goes before. We see that show up in Scripture all the time. And I think sometimes we we don't look for that. We don't look for how God is always initiating. And I think that's one of the things that I've been chewing on and has been sticking with me the most um, is we often read ourselves into these stories, and we read ourselves into and try to and identifying with specific characters, both in their righteousness and in their sinfulness, and then we find ourselves relating, which gets us off of the point of the main character of all of these stories, which is God, which is what we see in this episode with Solomon. Is that Solomon in this moment is recognizing that that what is in front of him. This invitation that God has given to him to be king, to ascend to the throne of his father, David, knowing who his father was. And again, there's kind of this whitewashed view uh, of his father. Like, you know, in this episode, it doesn't come up all the indiscretion, but it just comes up a, of, you know, how David was faithful to God and God was gracious and steadfast in his love to David. Kind of we hear the beautiful side of, of their story. Uh, but regardless, you have Solomon Responding to God's request of what do you want? Anything you want, I will give it to you. Um, he doesn't ask for wealth. He doesn't ask for fame. He doesn't ask for military power or conquest. He asks for wisdom, the ability, the capacity to rule and discern well in, in, in line with who God is and God's character. And God honors that request. And I think what sticks out to me the most and where I want us to land and kind of chew on and recognize, I think the call of this story and I think the, the overarching narrative of, of the biblical text is that in all things, God goes before, God is inviting us to participate in the things that God is doing in this world. And those are all things that without an alignment and a surrender to and an obedience to God's will, not just in our lives, but in what God is doing in the world, Outside of that, we will we will miss the mark. And in the antidote, right, to comparison and the comparison creep, as we've talked about, is the, is wisdom and not having wisdom. And I think that's one of the things where the Solomon got wisdom, and then we don't see the same kind of posture. And again, we're just reading part of the story, and I'm I admit I'm reading into this text, like I just talked about. Um. But we don't see Solomon maintain the same posture uh, of, you know, being overwhelmed with the task and recognizing that he needs God to, to guide and direct. It's almost as if, and I wonder if it's this sense of like, I've received wisdom. 
it starts out really good and I'm just going to continue to do the things that I think are right, not knowing all of the influences that are coming in, particularly from his, I don't know, 700 foreign wives and 300 con concubines. Uh, and so it, it, a reluctance to see the ways in which the slow creep of comparison and influence has on the life of Solomon and his leadership to where toward the end of his life, he deviates from where he finds himself starting out at the beginning. And I think that's true for all of us in our lives. It is a, it is a slow creep. We find ourselves in places that we are not overnight, but over time. And, and I think it's this call to not just ask for wisdom once, not just to surrender our lives in, in a singular moment, but to maintain this posture of humility and surrender and asking the God who goes before to continue to pour out wisdom, discernment, grace, so that we recognize that it's a reliance on the person of God to navigate what comes before us. So I'm excited to crack it open on Sunday. I'd encourage you to read read the text. It's uh, uh we are in uh I believe oh, let me see my little notes. First Kings, yeah, First Kings chapter three, verses three through fourteen is the text. Um and then you can even read the next story. It's one of my favorites. I don't know why. Um I reference it a lot when I'm thinking about decision making, but it's uh it's the I call it Solomon's uh, cut the baby in half moment. Uh, this example, which I'll probably touch on just a little bit, because it gives us an example of the kind of wisdom that God gave Solomon to lead God's people. Uh, and it's an example of what that began to look like. So excited for Sunday. Hope you are as well. And we will see you all soon. Blessings.